regarding dr tumara rats uh, she is a professor of tourism and head of tourism department at uh, uh, kudulani jenos uh, university hungary she obtained her phd in uh, 2000 from the budapest university of economic sciences and public administration with a thesis investigating the socio cultural impacts of tourism development at lake ballet on hungary she has extensive experience of teaching abroad she has been a guest professor at hmk university of applied sciences finland uh, during the year 95 till 2011 uh, karaganda economic university kazakhstan during the uh, year 2011 till 2014 and university of bologna during the year 2017 till 18 so she has a lot of uh, global exposure which she has uh, she has received she taught uh, various tourism related courses in the uh, democratic peoples republic of korea russia spain turkey poland and the netherlands bulgaria ukraine and norway she serves as editorial board member and reviewer of more than 20 journals in tourism and acts as co editor of the tourism academy book series in hungary uh besides this she is the author or co author of more than 190 publications on tourism including 12 book her current research interests include cultural and heritage tourism development and management and the topic would be revolving around this particular theme as well creativity and innovation in niche tourism development and the phenomena of unconventional tourism mobility so she has uh, so many uh, kind of uh, she is dealing with so many kind of uh, uh, various aspects of tourism domain and I, i i hope this would be a very wonderful session which we'll be having with dr tumara and coming back to professor uh, parikshit singh manas uh, who is our regular expert and the main uh, the flag bearer or you can say the the main uh, inventor of this particular international web lecture series and uh, regarding him uh, he is a professor in the business school uh, university of jammu plus coordinator global understanding course which is being run uh, in association with east carolina university of united states and beside this he is also the director of university business incubation and innovation center as well as president institutional innovation council university of jammu so he is also handling so many positions at the same time and he is also a visiting professor of many universities at national and international level and having research interests in areas of recreation hospitality management uh, management education marketing sustainable and responsible tourism brand management post conflict tourism peace building strategies revival tourism film induced tourism and destination marketing so he is also uh, is also abreast of so many uh, various forms of tourism uh, which are still you know few of them are still upcoming like film induced tourism so uh, professor manas also won the institute of hospitality education research award in 2016 at the european council of hotel restaurant institutional education conference held at budapest uh, in the year 2016 besides this he also received many prestigious uh, awards at the international level including hungarian faculty research fellowship in 2000, 2013 as well as uh, he won the best career award for uh, uh, for uh, best young teacher awarded by all india council of technical education government of india Besides this, he has written more than ten books and more than hundred research papers in his kitty. So, so uh, I now I would request, without wasting any time, I can see that uh, most of our, our students have joined. So, I would again request uh, our esteemed experts uh, for today. I'll switch to Professor Manas to kindly initiate the session. <clears throat> Very good afternoon, Nikhil. Uh, very good afternoon to my fellow expert today dr tumara rats and uh, to all the other colleagues that we have from various universities i could see that we have participation from philippines from indonesia from egypt from hungary from kazakhstan so that's that's a nice mix and a very oh, good wow. mix. and uh, it's it's nice to have you all around uh, i again welcome all the students also who have been our regular participants and some of them are coming for the first time thank you being for being and uh, part of this particular series um it's it's our endeavor constant endeavor i'll start sharing my screen first then i can continue okay so here we go so that's yeah just let me settle down few things
Okay. So uh, to begin with, I would uh, request everyone to just mute their mics and uh, you can also switch on your uh, switch off your videos because that takes a lot of bandwidth and a lot of students will not be able to uh, see and the streaming may not be proper. Uh, so I would request all of you, maybe you can switch on, switch off your videos as well as audio so that uh, you can listen to the experts with a lot more clarity. Uh, to begin with, <clears throat> this is an initiative that we took a couple of uh, weeks back and today we are here at an eighth lecture of ours. I have a, I've, been, I've been having constant support of my fellow colleagues, Dr. Ramjeet, Dr. Jeet Dogra, uh, Mr. Nikhil and Dr. Kannappan from Taylor's University and they have been supporting me in this. And we have been trying to come up with something new for our students and uh, uh, all the audience that we are catering to. We are also uh, at this moment live on Facebook. So we are, we are working on that also. So it's, it's nice to have you all around. Let me start with uh, what we have today. Uh, we are going to talk about art, culture, creativity in urban tourism. So uh, as our endeavor has been, constant endeavor has been to talk about something which is more related to hardcore hospitality and tourism. And obviously everybody is speaking about COVID here and there and here and there. But we don't want to just concentrate on COVID factor, but we want to keep our students appraised about what is theoretically happening within our industry and how it is moving. Uh, we have one of the very good experts, Tamara Rats, over here with us. Uh, as I started with last time, where I told you that I'm going to have my first slide is going to be about the updates. So uh, what has happened in past two days? So our last lecture was on Wednesday, mm -hmm. so Thursday, Friday. What has happened in between and what is uh, the governments of various, uh, uh, various countries are doing and what our Apex organization, UNWTO, is thinking about and what it is talking about? Trust. So this is something which is very important, which UNWTO had, has put it on their website and they say trust is the new currency. So that's a very important aspect. And this is, this is trust is a very big word. Uh, the way uh, tourism industry thrives and what it works on, uh, trust is going to be the one of the very important factors. As I was talking about in my earlier lectures, where I talked about the fact that there are going to be new protocols, new, uh, new normals, the sanitization techniques are going to change. People are going to be more hygiene conscious. So trust is going to be a very important factor because then you have to feel that the organization whose services you are uh, using, maybe be it airlines, be it hotel, be it restaurant, they are trustworthy. That means whatever they are trying to talk about, whatever the rules and regulations are, they are following them. So trust is going to be very important. And this trust, this is hospitality and tourism industry is concerned, all the TMCs are concerned, and all the youngsters uh, who are part of this particular lecture, I would like to brief you that Whatever work that you do, now you have to build up trust amongst your customers and do it to, your, uh, to, to a level where everybody starts believing that you are important and you are doing it in a proper and an effective, efficient manner. World Cup winner, Casillas, is going to be the special ambassador for responsible tourism. He's the Spanish World Cup winner. So that's another addition that we have. Uh, uh, according to UNWTO, May, in May, they are talking about reduced inequalities. So inequalities, they are referring to as the fact that the way the world is suffering around the globe and the way things are panning out, a uh, lot of countries, people are not able to have even one meal a day. So these inequalities need to be reduced. These inequalities need to be taken care of. And that's what uh, the month of May is being dedicated towards to see to it that the gap between the rich, the poor have and have not is reduced considerably. And uh, what, how it is being done, uh, obviously, tourism sector is stepping up support for its employees, communities. Uh, we, we have seen that airlines, uh, as I told you last time, near about 100% of destinations or 100% of countries have travel restrictions. And 72% of these global destinations have their borders closed. So that means 95% of airlines are not operating. Near about 90 to 95% of hotels are not operating whichever uh, hotel is operating, they are only working on vis-a-vis -vis F&B services are concerned and that's what is going to come out. Uh, World Committee on Tourism Ethics has found out that companies, this is a heartening fact, a lot of organizations, just not in hospitality and tourism uh, industry, but in other industries also are coming forward and are going way beyond their CSR limits, their corporate social responsibility limits. They are going way beyond that. And they are, in, in a way, trying to help the customers, trying to help uh, common men and trying to help their employees. So that's a very heartening aspect. So these are a couple of updates that we have uh, over past two, three days that I could uh, get hold of and which I wanted to share with my students. So you can always 
find out what's going on. Now, coming back to our topic, creativity, art, culture, urban tourism, obviously the expert is going to talk about it later, but I'm going to just give you a brief uh, introduction of this particular topic and how things are panning out. Well, culture and art are picking up in a very big way. Basic social behavior and norms found in social, uh, human societies, that's what our culture is all about. And now we have this creativity bug coming into it. Now, the fact that uh, technology interventions are being built up in every industry and same is the case with art culture. So when the technology interventions are coming up because of which we are making this more and more likable, more or more appreciable and people are getting more used to it and creativity com is coming into it. Uh, one of the very important aspects is uh, uh, urban tourism, the city tourism. Obviously, we were talking about that a lot of cities around the globe uh, have been at this moment facing the concept of over tourism but this over tourism has now gone out of the window so now we have uh, under tourism going on but this urban tourism is uh, where the city is one of the main destination of activities and where all the activities are centric and i'm going to explain it in times to come that how things are uh, panning out or how things are moving because this, this is concerned uh, art and culture are actually signaling the expansion of tourism this is one of those strands of tourism which is actually uh, earlier art and culture was only limited to a certain segment of people who were only uh, who were who were very keen in these particular things but now these cultural festivals these are actually helping in the expansion of tourism and many cities many cities have gained a lot of lot, lots and lots of importance because of this georgetown georgetown in penang in malaysia is one of those which is picking up in a very big way the georgetown festival was a huge hit and a very small place i'm going to talk about that also uh, later these festivals have now started becoming as tourist attractions and uh, all these uh, tourist attractions are in a way getting more and more tourists and actually the cities are benefiting in a bigger way because of, uh, because of this. Uh, festivals serve as catalysts creating interest and initiating uh, activity in arts and culture. See what actually what these uh, festivals try to do and this art and culture tries to do, it tries to build up a narrative, a narrative which is which uh, through which you can explain to the world uh, what you all uh, what what your uh, culture or what your country or what your city actually refers to or means there are cities which are which are, which are so old but their narratives are not correct where people have not built up a positive narrative about them through art and culture by show, showcasing your art and culture by coming up with these uh, uh, these uh, these, uh, these 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 festivals you can build up a right narrative regarding your city and the best part is the stage, the city itself emerges as a performing space. That means you don't have to go to a theater or something like that. The city in its own self becomes a performing space where, where people have these activities done in one corner of the city and they move on to the another square of the city. So these, these festivals actually give you a bigger canvas to play around and to showcase. Uh, well, the intangible creativity and art and culture, the business of urban tourism. Well, what we are trying to talk about is we are trying to talk about the traditional contemporary living at the same time. So that's a very important aspect where city is new, where the new, new aspect is there, but the old aspect is also uh, kept inclusive where, where all the people and the citizens within that particular community are taken into account. What I mean uh, to refer over here is creativity plus culture plus art plus tourism is equal to revenue. So that's, that's the uh, uh, way that uh, your uh, city can, or the communities or the stakeholders within that city can earn a lot. Accessibility of art and culture, free public events are being organized. So that makes it uh, very important for people to uh, understand also, know about also, and uh, showcase their uh, city's history also. A lot of economic benefits uh, accrue because of this. Uh, your cafes, restaurants, and shops come up within these particular cities and they are able to build up in a bigger way. Uh, boutique and heritage hotels. So that's one of the very important aspects and very big economic effect. Uh, we have seen in Rajasthan, in, uh, in India, where a lot of boutique and heritage hotels have come up and they, they charge a lot more than the traditional five-star properties. So they charge a lot because they, they give that uh, different feeling to the customers where the customers are able to understand and uh, live the way the ancient people or way the kings or our maharajas used to live. It's, it's a brand in, in itself. Each city becomes a brand in itself. And some of these great festivals that we have that are going on is Hong Kong International Art Fair 
and then uh, United Arab Emirates, we have Art Dubai, Vivid Sydney. So all these festivals have in a way uh, created a unique brand for these particular cities. And you can see the murals or the, the paintings on the walls, uh, they, are, they are liked around the globe. They, they, become, uh, they, they, they become synonym to these cities and people queue up for hours and hours to take pictures with them. You know, uh, all those uh, friends of ours or participants today who, have, who had attended our last lecture, uh, Dr. Puva talked about the fact that how in Bali they had to queue for five hours for that picture to be taken. So for one picture, he had to queue at seven o'clock and for till 12 o'clock, his turn did not come vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that picture was concerned. So he had to queue for five hours to get just one picture clicked because that was a historic picture and it had that set of a background which was artificially created to some extent. But the fact was that it becomes a craze and people start lining up and people start building up for those particular things. So that's how you build up that narrative within the minds of the uh, customers or tourists. And that's how you bring up that creativity aspect. I'm going to sh This is the picture now. This is a picture. I just spoke about the fact that this is in Georgetown. So this is in Penang, Georgetown. And this, this picture has gone viral. And this picture, this particular spot, to stand there to get a picture clicked, I had to wait for 45 minutes. 45 minutes, and you can just see the background. It, it, is, it, is, it is within the heart of the city, not a developed. You can, you can imagine that it must be a slum dwelling or something like that. But this is the place where people were queuing up, and there was a lot of music and everything going around over there, and people were waiting to get pictures. So this is how the branding aspect is building up. This is how things are things have been building up. These are a couple of my two cents. Again, I keep uh, talking about the flexibility will be the key. You all have to be flexible. And I'm speaking to various experts around the globe and trying to see to it that how hospitality and tourism students could be flexible, what all trades they could uh, learn during this COVID time so that they could be more useful for the society. And those people are going to come and lecture you in times to come. So I keep maintaining the fact uh, the two facts that I was maintaining, one was resilience and one was flexibility. Resilience, now everybody's talking about, and flexibility will also be one of those things that is going to be very, very important. So stay home today to travel tomorrow. That's the hashtag that is trending from UNWTO. So that's something from my side. Uh, I'll hand it over to Tamara for her lecture. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Manhas. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can, we can. Okay, great, thank you. So, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to be here. Um, I'm very grateful and I'm also very excited. Uh, I had the chance to, to listen to some of the, the earlier uh, lectures and I was absolutely impressed by the organization, by the concept and the structure of this project, it's, it's really, really fascinating. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be able to uh, join here. So today, uh, the topic I selected- i my screen, Tamara, so now you can start sharing yours, yeah. Yeah, 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 I did that, yeah. I'm trying to move the waiting room announcements from my screen. So, I think we are all set. So, the topic I selected for today uh, is art, culture, and creativity in urban tourism and city tourism. And my rationale was exactly what you mentioned. And thank you so much for this introduction because it uh, created the perfect setting for, for my, uh, my lecture. My rationale was exactly that we should talk a little bit about something else as well than the COVID, uh, the pandemia, and the situation. Obviously, we cannot disregard it because it's, uh, it affects everything in tourism. But I thought that uh, let's, let's have a different angle today. And to start this lecture, I would like to show you um, um, uh, the top 10 cities list uh, recommended by the Lonely Planet, recommended last year. So obviously this uh, list, uh, the reasons why certain cities are included in this list uh, are not longer relevant, but uh, these are the, those 10 cities that Lonely Planet uh, recommended as best in travel for 2020. You can see they are all around the world. One Kochi is in India. And if you look at the, the reason why these cities were um, recommended particularly uh, for travelers, 
uh, we find lots of uh, cultural references. So in the case of, I'm not going to go through all these treaties, but just I uh, want to show you a few examples. Uh, so in the case of Salzburg, uh, Austria, it's the Salzburg Festival, which is uh, celebrating its 100 years. So it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, cultural festival with uh, obviously classical music, but uh, exhibitions, events, etc. Uh, in the case of Washington DC, again, culture is the, the number one reason why the city is included uh, in this list. Uh, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave uh, women the, the right to vote. Uh, so various cultural institutions are going to host events, uh, exhibitions, etc. to celebrate this uh, amendment, this major milestone. Uh, in Bonn, Germany, uh, they are celebrating Beethoven's uh, 250th birthday. And again, uh, there are lots of different programs uh, besides classical concerts. Uh, and I particularly would like to highlight home concerts where local musicians uh, open their doors to the public because this is going to be one of the important messages of, uh, of my uh, presentation that it's very, very important uh, to take culture out of the classical cultural institutions and share them with uh, a wider uh, public. Galway, Ireland uh, is one of the European capitals of culture uh, in 2020. I don't know how familiar with you are with this uh, project, but in Europe every year there are two cities that share this title. Uh, and it's a special opportunity for these cities to, to show their culture, their heritage uh, to the world. Uh, of course, this is one of those events that are very significantly uh, affected uh, by the, the COVID uh, crisis, since many of the, the opening events and many of the events in the first half of the year had to be postponed or canceled. Uh, but hopefully in during the summer and the second part of the year, uh, they can uh, organize all those um, exciting events that they have planned. Then for me, it was a very, very interesting example to, to see, an interesting case to see Kochi uh, uh, in Kerala on this uh, list, uh, particularly as one of the, the main events that was highlighted uh, in the rational, in the explanation of why this city should be visited in uh, 2020 is uh, at the Kochi Museum's Biennale, uh, an amazing contemporary arts uh, festival. And uh, when I uh, wanted to, to find more information about this, this festival, uh, it's going to uh, be organized from December uh, till April 2021. So uh, you still have a chance to plan a trip there. Uh, I really loved uh, that um, the origin, this uh, explanation for the festival, that it was funded on the conviction that art is essential in society. It's not only a tourist event, of course, it's a very important event for the local population as well. And uh, uh, it's been organized since 2020, uh, 2012, sorry. And it, it's proved to be very, very popular. And the last city on the list that I, I uh, wanted to highlight is Denver in the United States, uh, a city which is, uh, I guess, especially in outside of the States, is more famous for the mountains surrounding us, so for the natural scenery. But even in this case, um, culture plays a very important role in the city's uh, tourism industry. Okay, uh, and if you look at this, uh, the, the three um, uh, expressions that I highlighted, uh, you find basically those three components uh, that I think are, are that I think are particularly important in uh, urban cultural tourism uh, museums or cultural institutions in general, architecture. Uh, which is playing an increasingly important role in, in uh, urban development, but also in urban cultural development. And the fact that uh, these, this uh, museum, for example, is located within uh, a creative district. So there is uh, a district or there is a quarter uh, that, tries to, that, that hosts various cultural industries. 
So if you look at um, cultural products in urban tourism, uh, you can see that there is a difference depending on the size of the destination. So villages on, are, and towns are usually uh, offering heritage experiences based on the local history, uh, local heritage. Uh, and as we, uh, as the, uh, the size of the, the destination is, is increasing, uh, the arts and the creative industries are playing an increasingly important role. Uh, arts, including performing arts and visual arts, and the creative industries, including uh, architecture, film, uh, cinema, um, uh, design, uh, etc. So, urban tourism, well, I don't think you, I need to exp uh, explain this definition, you can read it for yourself. Uh, but an important aspect of urban tourism or uh, urban uh, destinations that they offer a very wide range of different uh, experiences, uh, including cultural experiences, uh, architectural experiences, uh, experiences related to the art. And when you think about art and culture in urban tourism, uh, they uh, play the role of attractions. So they motivate travelers, stimulate travelers to visit a particular destination. Uh, they can also be considered resources or catalysts uh, for uh, urban development in general, economic development, the development of uh, services, the development of the creative industries, as we have already heard. And they also provide a setting, they also provide a scenery uh, for tourism development. Uh, so they, they affect the destination's atmosphere uh, in, a, in a very uh, crucial way. Uh, art tourism is, is an often slightly neglected element of, of cultural tourism. Uh, it, there's a very simple definition um, of art tourism, that's any activity that involves uh, travel to see art. Uh, it is uh, part of cultural tourism, obviously, as art is part of culture, but uh, art tourists, or art motivated tourists usually have a very, very strong focus on, on, on seeing, experiencing, enjoying art, like I said, visual or uh, performing art. And I was thinking about uh, the way um, this COVID um, uh, crisis affects tourism or cultural tourism, urban tourism in general. And uh, in my opinion, art tourism is one of those areas that are probably the least uh, affected in the sense that there are uh, an increasing number of excellent virtual uh, tours. Here you see an example of the Louvre where uh, there are different uh, options like one minute in the museum, uh, a Mona Lisa virtual reality experience, a closer look at the Louvre uh, artworks. So if somebody is particularly interested in art, uh, there is an opportunity to, to see, especially um, visual artworks uh, online. Although obviously this, uh, this experience does not replace the, the actual experience. Uh, I think the reason why many museums or many uh, galleries uh, have created such a virtual visit is that they can be used as reminders, keeping uh, uh, a connection between the audience and the, the, the institution. And hopefully they will stimulate uh, further uh, actual travel when it becomes possible. Uh, art uh, and culture related tourism in urban settings include uh, attendance uh, at different cultural events, visiting museums, galleries, uh, and participation in, in various creative activities. There is a very strong correlation between art consumption and home and art consumption uh, away from home. Uh, so this segment is usually considered a very, a very attractive uh, market segment, uh, higher educated than the average uh, visitor, higher spending. Uh, so many destinations are focusing on attracting uh, tourists interested in culture and arts. Uh, uh, they have a key role in urban regeneration. Uh, in many cases, uh, post in, even post-industrial areas or uh, find uh, cultural development as one solution to uh, the fact that um, industries leaving 
uh, Europe, for example, uh, need, leave a, a space behind them. There is a need to create jobs. There is a need to create services. So cultural development often uh, fills uh, these uh, gaps uh, left behind by uh, in the post-industrial uh, societies. And this has led to something that Lorente called a golden age of museum building. And I will show you uh, several examples uh, that many cities, many destinations uh, have found uh, that uh, creating an iconic cultural institution uh, can be a catalyst for uh, economic development, urban uh, regeneration. Uh, Art and artists play a key role in uh, identifying, highlighting the aesthetic values, the cultural values and destinations. So they can also contribute to the branding uh, of destinations or rebranding destinations, uh, changing uh, the image of a destination or changing the position uh, of a destination in the, the global tourism market, as you could see in the examples uh, on the Lonely Planet uh, top 10 list. Uh, the growth, the appearance of new art spaces uh, also uh, stimulates this process. And there has been an important shift in orientation uh, from education to engagement. I will talk a little, uh, talk about it a little uh, later in a little bit more detail. Uh, another typical uh, phenomenon is the transformation of industrial buildings into cultural spaces. And there have been very uh, interesting uh, top-down uh, and bottom-up initiatives. Top-down meaning that uh, the local government, the city government, the regional government, or even the national government decided on the creation of uh, a major uh, cultural project like uh, and the Guggenheim Bilbao, which has been the, the, the most famous or the, the most um, um, internationally most known uh, example of this approach, but also there are lots of bottom-up initiatives when artists are filling uh, abundant spaces, creating uh, street art, as we could see, for example, in uh, Professor Manhas's presentation, uh, creating small galleries, uh, various creative uh, activities, and these processes start to, to uh, contribute to the gentrification of an area, but also contribute to, to increasing tourism flows. And an important aspect of uh, the role of art and culture in urban tourism is the role of art in public spaces, uh, because uh, artworks exhibited uh, in the public space may have a different, uh, an important impact on a destination's uh, milieu, the atmosphere, but also provide uh, access for all kinds of customers, for those who, who generally or normally do not visit museums or do not go to the theater or to the opera uh, due to various reasons, financial. have an important uh, role in, uh, in urban tourism. So two examples here of uh, development of iconic uh, museum buildings. Uh, on the left, uh, the, the building that looks like a, a desert rose is the National Museum of Qatar, a brand new museum opened last year. And on the right, uh, the Abu Dhabi Louvre, uh, a very, very interesting cultural uh, project, uh, cooperation between France and uh, the Emirates. I will talk about this a little later. And uh, two examples of art in public space. Uh, one is uh, 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 in uh, Spain, in Bilbao, uh, Puppy by Jeff Koons in front of the, the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, and on the right, uh, you see a, an interesting initiative, an example of an interesting initiative by uh, an Italian artist uh, who used uh, classical art uh, representations uh, and submerged them, uh, put scuba gear, uh, scuba diving gear on uh, these pieces uh, and uh, scattered them around in 
first in Florence, but then in other Italian cities as well. Uh, they can, since there is a number of such pieces, they can also motivate visitors to try to collect them, to find all of them. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the changing role of art museums because they have contributed significantly to uh, destination development, uh, branding, as I already mentioned, they play a key role in, in destination image. Uh, there has been a, a major shift from uh, scientific education orientation towards edutainment, the combination of uh, uh, education and entertainment. Uh, and engaging visitors, interacting with visitors, and they have become tourist sites, and sometimes just the building. Uh, so the architecture plays uh, an important, increasingly important form. It may uh, actually be considered as a, a form of contemporary uh, art. Um, uh, of course, the question whether there is a harmony between uh, the building and the exhibition uh, can often be asked. But usually, yes, usually these modern uh, art uh, institutions host uh, exhibitions that are uh, in harmony with the, the, the building. Uh, so they, they uh, offer what they promise. Uh, an interesting um, development is museums without their own collections. So only based on temporary exhibitions. Traditionally, a museum uh, by definition had a collection, but this is also changing in order to provide uh, uh, a constantly renewed experience to the visitors. Visitor satisfaction very much depends on the total experience. So not just on the, the art or the cultural experience, uh, the exhibition, but also on uh, other services like um, uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, guided tours, uh, shopping experiences, etc. And as I already mentioned, uh, the changing role of art museums, museums in general, uh, can be expressed or led to the so-called Guggenheim or Bilbao effect, uh, where the development uh, or the creation of one iconic uh, museum, uh, cultural institution, led to the regeneration of the city. And um, uh, many destinations all around the world uh, try to follow or copy the example of Bilbao, but of course uh, the situ it's, it's not such an easy uh, situation. So in, in the case of Bilbao, the success of this approach depended on, on a complex set of factors, on the regeneration of the, the transportation network of the city, on the regeneration uh, of the, the waterfront area, on uh, uh, initiatives to services and uh, creative industries, but other kinds of services as well. So it's not as simple as it looks like that if a destination uh, invests a fortune in, a, in a, an iconic uh, cultural institution, then it will become an overnight success. Uh, I wanted to show you a few examples of this process starting from the, the 50s. Uh, of this process of the transformation of, uh, of museums. Uh, one of the first examples that I wanted to show is the, the original Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, which was one of the first, basically the first museum that uh, left this traditional museum architecture behind. And the first museum where the architecture form played a particularly important role. And that's why, uh, Paul Goldberger, famous critic, said about the museum, the Guggenheim, that almost every museum of our time is a child of the Guggenheim. Uh, you can see uh, some details of the building here. This, uh, there is a, a spiral, uh, basically a uh, form, uh, and visitors can walk up and down. Uh, it's not. Uh, the best form for all kinds of art, obviously, but uh, it has become an icon of New York. Of course, uh, the success of the Guggenheim uh, is also depends on other factors like its setting in New York, but it uh, started, as you can see here, uh, uh, a network of Guggenheim museums. Uh, there have been some others as well, which have closed by now, so I didn't include them in this slide. But now there is, uh, besides the original Guggenheim Museum, uh, there is uh, one uh, branch in Venice, in uh, Bilbao. 
that has already been mentioned. And uh, Abu Dhabi is planning uh, to build one. Uh, the original, the, the date for the opening uh, was 2022, but now we will see if uh, this crisis has in, uh, affected in any way uh, this construction. As I said, of course, the success of the, the Guggenheim in New York is also influenced by the fact that it's located in New York's Museum Mile, so uh, close to the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, next to Central Park, uh, also not too far from uh, another uh, world famous museum, Museum of Natural History. So there is uh, uh, obviously this uh, synergy effect uh, among these institutions. Another example, not a museum, but an iconic uh, art uh, institution is the Sydney Opera House that I'm sure you are all uh, familiar with. Uh, it uh, uh, was built in the 70s and uh, 73 and it took, uh, as you can see, it took quite a long time to finish uh, the construction and uh, it has become an icon of Australia, not just Sydney, but Australia uh, and the national icon as well and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Building. And its setting, it's a geographical setting plays an, uh, almost an equally important role as the architectural quality uh, of uh, this uh, building. Another uh, particularly interesting example uh, from uh, 1977 is the Pompidou Center in France, uh, which was the first new generation museum building in the sense that it included lots of other uh, services as well, a library, public spaces, uh, event spaces, a multifunctional art center, uh, and it has a particularly uh, uh, special, unusual uh, architectural style. It's an inside out construction where all the, the pipes uh, are outside the building and you can see based on the, the color, whether it's an air pipe or an electricity cable, uh, a pipe uh, including an electricity cable, etc. Uh, it's not a particularly beautiful building. Uh, I guess we can agree on that. So not surprising that National Geographic uh, wrote about it, that it's love at second sight. But it has also contributed very much to uh, this progress of how museums have changed throughout history and it's one element in, uh, in this, this process and helped uh, us to get where we are now in terms of uh, museum quality, museum uh, expectations concerning museums. An important aspect of the, the success of the Pompidou Center was that the architects decided to build in only half of the space that was allocated for the museum. So as you can see on the picture, uh, there is a large open space in front of this uh, building, which has uh, become a very popular meeting uh, point, meeting place for uh, tourists and Parisians alike. And the fact that it has become a meeting place also contributed to uh, establishing this museum in the, uh, in the conscious, the, in the mind of both visitors and the local residents. And then uh, the famous Guggenheim Bilbao, uh, which uh, opened in 97. And uh, in, in a city that was not an established cultural destination, in a city that struggled with uh, um, problems of unemployment, uh, with problems of Basque separatism, crisis of the steel industry, and it was a major uh, risk. It's a huge gamble to decide to uh, uh, commission such a, a project, uh, but uh, the investment has proved to be very successful. So the Basque uh, regional government uh, spent uh, uh, 100 million uh, dollars, US dollars, on this project. Uh, they also invested in uh, the collection and, of course, uh, uh, paid uh, the Guggenheim Foundation for the, the brand name. Uh, their slogan, uh, El Arte lo cambia todo, uh, the art changes everything, has proved to be true in the case of the Guggenheim because it truly transformed Bilbao and uh, the region. Uh, to an established cultural destination. It's a very unusual uh, building and the waterfront uh, surrounded by um, art. Uh, this is uh, Mamon, uh, mother, uh, by uh, 
uh, Louis Bourgeois, it, uh, it is uh, one of a series of similar um, um, sculptures. The original one is the, in, uh, the, in London, in the Tate, uh, but there is another one in, uh, in Canada and some of them are, are traveling. Uh, other works of art uh, by Anish Kapoor, uh, a very well-known Indian uh, sculpture, uh, and uh, a fog uh, sculpture by a Japanese artist, which is basically an ever-changing uh, work of art. Uh, the way the fog is uh, uh, moving around in the air, uh, highlighting or hiding the, the building or uh, the, the public art around it uh, is an ever-changing spectacle. It's, it's, um, it's never uh, permanent. Uh, so it's a very unique experience. And it's a very interesting example of contemporary art. It's, it's something that it's in, in, intangible, but still may be considered art as it stimulates uh, thinking, reflection, uh, etc. Uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao inside, so also the inside is, is very interesting, although there are lots of um, visitors to the city who do not even enter the museum, who uh, just enjoy the building from outside, the spectacle of the building from outside, although it's, it's definitely worth to enter. One of the most famous um, works of art uh, is uh, Richard Serra's The Matter of Time. Here you can see the model, and this is the, the actual piece that was uh, created for this building, particularly uh, for this uh, setting. It's um, a set of uh, ribbons of steel uh, in different forms, uh, ellipse, uh, spiral, and it's, it's a motion in, uh, it's a very interesting uh, combination between or a very interesting interplay of uh, motion and instability as visitors can walk around or among uh, these special forms. Uh, they can uh, experience a different environment depending on their movement and their perceptions. And you can see from this pram that uh, despite the fact that it's a very interesting uh, piece of contemporary art, it is also popular uh, with uh, families, with small children, even with small children. Uh, also uh, in the Guggenheim Bilbao, uh, another particularly um, um, spectacular um, piece, uh, which again has become a very popular uh, a topic for photos, uh, as again, which is an important aspect of urban tourism. A lot of uh, visitors want to uh, commemorate uh, their visits uh, and want to share their experiences on social media, Instagram, Facebook, etc. And such uh, pieces provide an attractive setting, provide a topic for uh, such a, uh, for a, uh, sharing actually invite the visitors to share uh, them on social media so contribute to the uh, to this um, to the marketing activities of the city not just of the museum but the whole city and uh, stimulate visitors to share their experiences so it's a it's a very uh, efficient way of promoting a destination basically it's um, uh, tulips by Jeff Koons again, like Poppy that we saw a picture of earlier. Uh, but of course, Bilbao is not only about the Guggenheim. Uh, the city has a very rich uh, cultural uh, life in, uh, in other forms as well, uh, lots of events, uh, and it has an interesting architecture as well. Another example I wanted to show you, it's also related to the European Capital of Culture project that I already mentioned. Graz in Austria was European Capital of Culture in 2003. And uh, this is when this unique uh, building, unique art museum, uh, Kunsthaus Graz, uh, was uh, opened. Uh, it's an example of biomorphic architecture, type of architecture that believes that uh, our uh, architecture doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to follow the classical uh, dimensions. It, it can be closer to representing uh, living uh, uh, creatures. 
Uh, there have been lots of uh, nicknames for this museum because of its uh, unusual, very unusual shape, like friendly alien, or an example of blobby texture, that it looks like a shapeless blob. Uh, it, it's one of those museums that do not have their own collection. Uh, their offer is based on temporary exhibitions, but it has uh, significant, significantly contributed to uh, grants receiving the UNESCO Design City uh, title in uh, 2011. And, uh, it's a certainly, it's a little bit similar to the, the Pompidou Center in the sense that it's not, not beautiful um, or generally it's not considered beautiful. It certainly provides a very memorable experience. Uh, this is how it looks from inside and also from outside from a different angle. Uh, the surface of the building can also be used for uh, various uh, light shows or screening. And Graz, generally, the Austrian city of Graz is a, is a very typical uh, Central European city. So that's why it was uh, even more interesting to see that the, the decision makers, uh, the project managers of this uh, European city of culture here decided to include such uh, unusual or such revolutionary a type of architecture in the city. It's not in the city center, so it, it also serves as an attraction, as a tool to um, spread out visitors to avoid issues of over-tourism, which used to be relevant before the, the COVID crisis. Uh, and uh, it, I think it was very, very, it is a very, very brave initiative uh, in, a, in a class cultural setting. Uh, and one of the last examples uh, is uh, one of the most interesting examples, recent examples, is the Louvre uh, Abu Dhabi, which uh, is built on cooperation in, in the framework of cooperation between uh, France and the Emirates. So between, uh, it's, um, it's a major uh, cultural investment. Uh, Abu Dhabi uh, is aiming to recreate, rebrand the city as uh, a cultural destination, as the cultural destination of the future. Uh, and uh, so they signed a 30-year contract with the Louvre in France for professional assistance and for uh, being able to use the brand name. But experts of the Louvre also assisted uh, this museum in the, uh, the collection, in, the, uh, in building their collection. It is the first universal museum of the Arab world in the sense that they, they focus very much on, uh, on uh, what we have in common. So uh, on universal topics, on the relationships of civilizations, uh, on the unity of uh, human culture. Uh, of course, throughout history, uh, differences uh, have been created, but deep down we share, uh, all humans share common values. And, and this is what uh, this, uh, this museum uh, uh, aims to, to present. And uh, the architecture, again, plays a key role in, the, in this uh, identity building uh, process. Uh, it is based on the, the Middle Eastern concept of the Medina. Uh, it consists of 55 buildings and there is a steel aluminum mesh dome that covers the building, uh, which uh, recreates uh, the feeling of uh, the stars, especially at night. Uh, you can see details of the building here. Mm. Uh, and you can see here the, the influence of Arabic architecture, uh, the, the similar uh, play of the light as it would be in an oasis here created by the, the dome. Uh, and uh, the first room uh, of the, this uh, museum presents uh, the same topic in groups of three. So three uh, sculptures of motherhood, three sculptures of uh, man on a horse, a horseman, three masks, three uh, human figures in, uh, in prey and praying. And uh, so you can see that the form, uh, the material, the style is different depending on which culture is represented but there are many common shared topics, themes, ideas uh, 
and this is this is one of the the most important missions of this museum to uh, draw our attention to what we have in common like i said uh, the collection of the museum is is uh, built uh, partly on objects borrowed like the egyptian uh, exhibition uh, partly by objects borrowed from other uh, institutions, other French uh, museums, certain French museums are involved in, uh, in this project, sharing uh, their collection with uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, like uh, uh, Whistler's mother from the Musée d'Orsay. And uh, they have also built their own collection. Uh, the portrait of George Washington is part of the, the, the Abu Dhabi Museum's collection. And of course, like I said, in the case of New York, uh, the success of the Abu Dhabi Louvre also depends, Louvre Abu Dhabi also depends on the, the success of Abu Dhabi as or the attraction of Abu Dhabi as a destination, which is also dependent on other factors like uh, the Etihad Towers uh, have, that have become famous uh, through the Fast and Furious uh, movie, I think uh, the sixth one in the series, or the Emirates Palace Hotel, which has become uh, a tourist attraction by itself, by the luxury it provides. And uh, this is one of those uh, uh, hotels where you can actually taste ice cream with gold, a gold uh, flake. It doesn't have any special flavor, but it, it's probably the ultimate um, example of luxury. And of course, uh, Abu Dhabi, one of uh, the, uh, the other globally significant attraction of Abu Dhabi is the Sheikh Zayed Mosque, uh, another recent development, uh, one of the most spectacular uh, mosques, new mosques, in art the architectural sense, in artistic sense in the world. And the second uh, topic I wanted to, to talk about uh, briefly, I also look at how much time we've got, yeah. A little, I, uh, this, going, this part is going to be shorter, is art in the street and street art. And this is a little video. I started here, I don't know if you can see it, I hope you can. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fountain in uh, Basel, Switzerland, uh, created by uh, Jean Tangley. Uh, a Swiss uh, sculptor and painter. And the reason why I wanted to show you this piece, I hope you could see the video, is uh, that it's a, it's a very good example of putting art out uh, in the public sphere, uh, attracting attention. It's, this is a very eye-catching and very entertaining uh, work. Uh, and attracting attention to the museum hosting uh, a large collection of uh, Jean Tangley's um, kinetic art in the city. Okay, sorry. Another example of art in public space uh, or use, using art in public space to create uh, destination identity is this building in uh, Lyon in France where a completely ordinary um, residential building has been transformed uh, into a fresco of the people of Lyon. Uh, on the balconies, on the painted balconies, as you can see, these are not real balconies, uh, you see uh, famous uh, persons who are connected to the history of Lyon, like uh, the chef Paul Bocuse, uh, probably the, the most famous French chef, the uh, creator of the Bocuse d'Or uh, culinary uh, competition or the Lumiere brothers, uh, who, to whom we can uh, uh, be grateful for uh, cinema, or uh, the author of The, the Little Prince, the Petit Prince, uh, Antoine de saint exupéry So in this case, public art is used as an expression of destination identity. Uh, it was created by an artist cooperative, and uh, for visitors, uh, these um, images can highlight the historic significance of Lyon, the Lyon's contribution to the world, and can also uh, draw their attention to aspects that maybe they were not familiar with. And they can uh, encourage, these, these pictures can encourage visitors to learn more about uh, the city. Art in public space, uh, as I said, is an important way to make art accessible uh, to all. Uh, 
Uh, this example here is the Cloud Gate uh, in Chicago, uh, created again by, by Anish Kapoor. Uh, it has become one of the icons uh, of the city, one of the most photographed uh, elements of the city. Uh, so it, it also contributes significantly to the attraction uh, of the destination and represents uh, the creativity embodied in the city. And uh, uh, this, this whole space filled with art, not just uh, the cloud gate, is a very, very popular public space for visitors and again for residents alike. Uh, Uh, street art and art in the street are not necessarily the same. Uh, street art can be, as I said, legal or illegal. Uh, although uh, good quality street art is often encouraged uh, by uh, city decision makers, uh, as you can see on the left, um, partly because artists can help uh, transforming uh, sometimes neglected spaces or can attract visitors as Professor uh, Mann has already mentioned to uh, uh, less popular uh, districts in a city. So they can create, uh, they can again contribute to the beautification of an area. Uh, they can contribute to uh, um, the restoration or uh, regeneration of an area. Uh, they can give a message that something uh, is happening here, that the creative uh, forces are uh, strong in this uh, destination or in this district. And this can be a catalyst for other services, for cafes, uh, shops, etc. Uh, but art in the street can also take different forms. Like here you can see this is a, a, a train, a railway subway. Uh, 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 passage, underground passageway, which is filled with art. Uh, it's a perfect way. It's an open air gallery, basically, uh, where people who are traveling by train and local residents, visitors can enjoy an ever changing collection uh, of uh, photos or paintings. Uh, so, an ever changing exhibition. And uh, to use uh, street art as um, the basis of uh, service development to create income as well, as we could hear that obviously the, the uh, major goal or major aim of tourism development is creating income, creating jobs, uh, is uh, organizing a tours uh, in a city that uh, can take visitors to less known, uh, less famous uh, areas, can help again uh, spreading visitors, uh, decreasing the special uh, concentration of demand uh, and also uh, such tours, walking tours uh, can help visitors uh, have a sense of discovery, finding uh, attractions, finding visual uh, elements that uh, uh, were not included in the guidebooks that are not first famous. So, and most visitors like to explore, like to have so discovery. And uh, including the, the, the less uh, developed districts of a, of a destination in uh, the tourism market of that particular destination can uh, provide benefits for uh, lots of usually small businesses. And so with this last picture, another street art, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think my, the participants today have taken a little bit of a world tour, right from Georgetown <laughs> to New York and they have been able to see what's going around and what's what's this art and culture is all about around the globe. Uh, but 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 it was nice, uh, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed. Nikhil, uh, you must have had collected some questions by now. Of course, sir. I have uh, plenty of questions. Can and you uh, share uh, the screen with us. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And uh, we'll we'll take a few quick questions actually. Uh, Right. I think we have overshot our time and a lot of our participants must be having other commitments, but we'll take one or two. Sorry. No, not an issue, not an issue. It was, it was very nice presentation. And uh, in fact, we could uh, 
the people in this part of the world could see that how uh, art and culture is taking a form in different parts of the globe. So it, it, it was nice that you could give them a mini world tour. I, that's what I was saying. And we could enjoy all the things that are going on around the globe. So uh, uh, this, this, this first question that's uh, on, won't the festivals harm, harm the concept of responsible tourism and harm the carrying capacity of the destination? So, would you take it, Tamara? Uh, yeah, I don't think why they would. Uh, festivals, of course, there are lots of different sizes of festivals. And it's true that the carrying capacity of a destination might be stretched since festivals uh, increase the number of visitors for a very short time. But I think that Festival organizers uh, generally uh, make a great efforts to organize uh, their events in a in a responsible way. Uh, many cases, uh, it, it is the festivals often are born from the uh, the the need or the willingness to share a particular aspect of of local culture of local heritage with the world. Uh, so the organizers are often strongly connected to the destination uh, and try to uh, protect or preserve the destination. Of course, there are some um, very large scale festivals where uh, this, this uh, the issue of responsible might uh, come up. But no, I generally, I, I don't think that uh, uh, that, that it's, a, it's a major threat now. Yeah, uh, I'll take it a little further. See, uh, responsible tourism refers to the fact that every aspect of tourism or every arm of tourism, we have to be responsible, be it adventure tourism, be it leisure tourism. So if we have responsible festival hosts, obviously there's going to be responsible tourism. If they take care of all the protocols, all the norms, obviously it's going to be responsible tourism. And it's just not the festivals. Even leisure tourism could be irresponsible in a way if people, if the, if the visitors are not uh, properly educated or if the uh, concerned DMO or the TMC has not taken into uh, um, account the con uh, proper guidelines, it could, they could also end up harming the uh, environment and uh, they, could be, they could not be sustainable. So the fact that how to make the sustainable, how to make any aspect of tourism sustainable, it depends upon the organizers, it depends upon the DMOs, and it depends upon the TMCs. How they, and we as stakeholders have to take a lead in that. So I, I don't feel that festivals per se will be, can be classified as not responsible or responsible, but it's the fact that how the activity is actually undertaken uh, and how it is executed on ground. Uh, what is the future of the urban tourism after the outbreak? So, uh, yeah, there are several questions related to this. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we will see what is the future of yeah. tourism uh, yeah. after the uh, the outbreak. Uh, many urban uh, urban attractions, I think, are suitable for uh, for social distancing. Uh, of course museums for example or any kind of closed spaces have to take uh, important considerations uh, in order to uh, ensure the safety of the visitors um, cultural tourism uh, if, if you look around around uh, europe that's that's what i'm more familiar with now uh, certain uh, destinations are opening up this week uh, next week um, museums uh, have opened in several uh, cities. Events uh, are still uh, limited in terms of number. Uh, other aspects of urban tourism that we haven't talked today are of course business uh, tourism, uh, which is probably going to uh, be a little slower uh, because on the one hand it has um, been proved that online communication can actually help or uh, replace uh, physical meetings, but on the other hand, it has also been proved that, that no, online communication cannot replace perfectly or completely physical meetings. Uh, I guess it's going to be slow. It also depends very much on uh, the transportation networks. If airlines start flying, uh, depends very much on the, on the regulation of movement. 
so uh, stakeholders, what stakeholders can do at the moment is comply with the regulations and uh, make an effort to ensure uh, that all the, the, the regulations are, are met and the, the visitor safety is uh, guaranteed. Yeah. And uh, uh, the fourth one also, the Wood Urban Cultural Tourism Revive. So I'll take these two together. See, first of all, I, I've, I've been categorically speaking over here and now it is also being talked by at various platforms. We are not talking about after the outbreak. We are talking about at this moment during the outbreak. So that's, that's totally a different scenario. So we are during the outbreak, we are during the COVID period and uh, in, in fact, couple of unconfirmed reports that are coming from WHO that's saying there's going to be a, there could be a period of four to five years before coronavirus is actually uh, totally eradicated or uh, shifted out of this planet. So that's a lot of time. So we have to first of all take into account during the outbreak. Now there are various mm -hmm. set of protocols that are being uh, that are being built up and these are going to be applicable on all forms of tourism. Uh, obviously as Tamara rightly said it's going to be slow. We, we had a, a discussion on mice tourism also a couple of uh, lectures back. We were, we were talking about mice also. Similar is the case with urban tourism. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a little slow, uh, obviously, but the fact is that they are going to stay, that it's not going to end up. And as I uh, mentioned in my earlier uh, lectures also and the way UNWTO reports are also coming in, the first form of tourism that's going to pick up is going to be the domestic one. So domestic tourist is the first form of tourist which is going to actually start visiting the nearby places. So 100, 150 kilometers. And the second, which is driven by more emotions, that is religious. So that's going to be there. So slowly, I think all forms of tourism will pick up. Urban tourism obviously has a lot more scope, what I, a lot more future than rural tourism or adventure tourism because urban tourism has one positive aspect that connectivity would be one very important aspect because all major cities are connected. So people would not like to deviate from the connectivity routes. Second, medical facilities at all the urban centers would be far more better than the, at the rural centers. So they would be always looking at going to places where they, there is a quick Medicare also, if just in case. So the safety aspect of the insurance aspect is also going to be taken care of. So what I feel is that uh, urban tourism is going to be one of those positive things. Uh, I think uh, we, we have overshot our time. All these questions, what we are going to do is, uh, I'll send these questions to you, Tamara, and what we are doing as uh, as a practice, we'll put them over uh, on our website, on our uh, Facebook okay. page, and uh, we'll have the answers on this Facebook page. Now we'll uh, over to Dr. Ramjeet for summing up uh, this particular lecture. 